Hello and welcome. I am Siddharth Zarabi and you are watching Business Today Television. Our guest on the show today is one of India's most well-known names in the information technology space, Francisco de Souza, managing partner and co-founder of Recognize. He was earlier the co-founder and former CEO of Cognizant, a company that he built up and scaled into an impressive entity. Welcome to the show, Francisco. It's good to have you. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. Let me begin by uh, getting you to talk about the overall Indian IT sector. The sector is facing uh, the negative he headwinds of a slowdown on the revenue front. Uh, we are seeing what's happening as far as global economies are concerned. It's also one, uh, Francisco, uh, that employs a lot of young Indian talent. But the news in the recent past has been negative. Uh, there are several companies which have gone slow on hiring freshers and they, this comes on the back of thousands of jobs that have been lo lost in the recent past. Uh, tell us about what do you think about the Indian IT industry at this point of time? So that, um, it's, a, it's, it's the question right now in the industry. Um, and I think, as you said, um, we have to look a little bit beyond the economic cycle to really understand what's going on. Um, certainly, the economic cycle has uh, some impact here, uh, but I think there are two other factors that you have to consider. Uh, the first is that the industry is going through a moment when you have a, a significant set of technology innovation driven by, uh, by artificial intelligence, and that's actually uh, a tailwind for the industry. There's a lot of work that needs to be done. Uh, on behalf of clients uh, to help them take advantage of the artificial intelligence um, uh, opportunity. Um, but at the same time, uh, AI is forcing the uh, industry uh, to rethink the business model, to rethink how they serve clients, to rethink how uh, customers um, benefit from the productivity benefits that AI is creating on behalf of um, uh, on uh, for for development in particular, and so you have three really distinct things going on. You've got a micro macroeconomic cycle. You've got a tremendous technology innovation, a discontinuity in technology, and then you've got a business model shift uh, with the industry. And all three of these things are coming together. In the long run, I'm very very optimistic for the industry. I think the world is becoming more technology intensive. All this new technology innovation that we're seeing, whether it's AI edge computing and 5G and so on and so forth will require uh, a significant amount of IT services to um, uh, to implement. And so um, specialized IT services players with, with strong capabilities are going to be the beneficiaries in the long run. You said in the long run, but what about the short term? Look, I, I think over, over the next quarter or two, you're going to continue to see volatility in the industry. I think that... Um, the macroeconomic uh, environment around the world continues to be somewhat uncertain. Um, uh, recent events of the past few days, uh, I think, have added to that uncertainty. Um, but as I said, uh, over the next, you know, I think over the next four quarters, you're going to see the emergence uh, of the industry once again, back to growth, back to substantial growth, uh, as um, the business model shift makes its way through the industry and then um, uh, essentially a new normal returns. Millions of Indian parents uh, put in their life saving uh, to educate their uh, children and the IT sector has been one of the biggest sectors as far as generating employment is concerned. But when layoffs happen, uh, they obviously get very worried. What would you say to those parents and young uh, engineers? Will there be a new normal uh, as far as hiring is concerned and do you see this continuing? and the impact of AI, which is also uh, perhaps going to change some of the hiring trends. You know, I, I, none of us have a crystal ball on this issue, but we'll here are a few facts that I think inform uh, uh, a view of the future. And I think pay, paint a relatively, uh, continue to paint a relatively optimistic view on the issue of employment and jobs. Um, I think the first point to note is that coming into this cycle, uh, by some estimates, there was a shortage of about 4 million software engineers around the world. So you went into the cycle with um, a tremendous shortage of, of engineers. Um, 
it, there's no question that that AI is making some parts of the software engineering or the software development lifecycle more productive, requiring less people. But overall, over the entire software development lifecycle, I think when when you when, when I look at that, um, I think that we continue to believe that there will be a significant amount of human effort required to create good, high quality software. And the third point I would make is that um, the the world in general is becoming far more technology intensive. And just one one anecdote on that is if you imagine that there are millions and millions and millions of applications in the world today, software applications that do different things. My view is that almost every single one of those applications will need to be rewritten uh, to be an AI application, reimagined, rethought, rewritten. Um, and that's going to create a tremendous demand uh, for software engineers, even if much of that software, if you believe a world where much of that software is, is developed by AI. And so if you look at these three things, we went in with a shortage, um, productivity benefits uh, across the entire software development lifecycle will be, will be there, but will still require um, human effort. And then finally, the fact that the world is becoming more technology intensive and every application in the world is going to have to be reimagined as an AI application, um, I think that creates uh, significant uh, employment in this industry uh, for the foreseeable future. Now, having said that, I think individuals uh, in the industry need to rethink their careers. They need to be even more focused on lifelong learning. Skills are changing faster than they've ever changed before. So if you, for those participating in the industry, I think uh, continuous learning, lifelong learning, retraining, uh, being willing to stay on the bleeding edge and really working to stay on the bleeding edge will become more important than ever before. Is artificial intelligence uh, a Y2K-like uh, opportunity for Indian IT companies? You know, I think uh, in some ways it is, but in many ways it's not. Um, it is it is a Y2K moment in that it um, uh, there's there's a tremendous amount. I would say it's more maybe perhaps the better analogy is it's more like the internet. Um, when when the internet emerged, there's a lot of opportunity that's been it's a it's a significant innovation. There's a lot of work to be done around AI, um, but unlike Y two K, uh, um, AI doesn't end on a specific date. AI uh, Y two K rather ended um, on January first, two thousand. Um, AI, I think, is here to stay and will continue to be a significant driving force, just as the internet or in the digital technologies or any of the other major innovations have been over the last uh, few decades. Viewers, Francisco grew uh, cognizant uh, at least tenfold from uh, billion point four uh, dollars in 2006 uh, to 16 billion dollars by 2018. And the headcount went from 39,000 to over 280,000. And these are numbers, viewers, that are very, very important uh, Francisco, if we talk about the evolution of the IT industry, from your point of view, what are the three key milestones which define the evolution of uh, Indian IT industry, uh, which has made Brand India proud all over the world? You know, I think that um, it's, it's a great question, Siddhartha, and I've had a pr the privilege of, of having a ringside seat, as you said, uh, on the industry. Um, you know, I think that that phase one of this industry was, um, you know, let's call it before uh, the early 1990s, uh, when, uh, um, you know, that was pre-internet, uh, when a group of real pioneers before my time um, figured out that there was an opportunity to build software in India for um, customers in other parts of the world. Uh, because in those days, um, and this sounds like ancient history now, but in those days, um, bandwidth in and out of India was uh, almost non-existent. Um, the, the primary form of software exports in those days uh, took the form of people actually traveling, either people going to the customer and working uh, approximate to the customer, or more often than not going to the customer understanding what needed to be done, returning to India, doing the work in India, and then returning back to the customer uh, to, do, to, to deliver the work. Uh, I think of that as generation number one. Generation number two was enabled really by two things in the, in the early 1990s, early to mid-1990s. 
the first was the economic liberalization that took place in India at that time. Uh, and then the second was the availability of bandwidth in and out of India. First, private bandwidth as India liberalized access to private bandwidth. Uh, but then over time, uh, during the decade of the 1990s, because of the internet. And as bandwidth became available, and then the price of bandwidth fell dramatically, it allowed the large number of Indian engineers to um, collaborate uh, seamlessly and virtually with clients all over the world. And that was really the second generation of uh, the Indian IT services industry. Um, through all of that time, though, uh, one of the observations that many had about the IT services industry is that the IT services industry and the technology industry in India in general um, started was really a, a business that was uh, serving the needs of other customers. Uh, it was a services industry. Um, and that, I think, led to the third generation of, uh, the, of India's technology industry, which is where we are now, in my mind. Um, and that was really enabled, in my mind, by some very fun fundamental investments that were made by the government in local infrastructure in India, uh, payments, national identity, and so on and so forth, which created a backbone of tremendous technology in the country and spurred the creation of local te um, uh, uh, technology companies and unicorns. So today, you know, India is home I think to the third largest number of unicorns, technology unicorns in the world. And I think that's a testament to entrepreneurs today building off the technology uh, services business that was built in those first two generations. And to me, this is, you know, maybe it's always the case that a new generation is the most exciting, but this, this new generation of technology in India, where you have indigenous innovation happening in India, which is being sold both in India, but in many other parts of the world, is the third and, and most exciting uh, evolution of the Indian technology industry. Let's shift our focus from uh, your role as the Cognizant co-founder to now a player in the private equity space. Uh, how's the journey been so far and uh, what are the key challenges you've faced? You know, it's been, it's been, a, it's been a remarkable few years for me personally. Um, when I left Cognizant, as you mentioned, having, built, having had the privilege of building a business uh, to, to substantial scale, um, I had the observation that the industry was moving to a place where scale was important for players like Cognizant. But equally, because technology is becoming more and more fragmented every day, that there was an opportunity to build a new breed, a new generation of highly specialized technology services players um, that were focused deeply on particular areas of the technology ecosystem. And it seemed to me both an opportunity, a business opportunity to do that, but also a personal opportunity for me to give back to a new generation of technology entrepreneurs in a way that um, allowed me to take uh, two and a half or three decades of learning from having built Cognizant and pass that along to a new generation of leaders. And so Recognize is focused entirely on uh, investing in the next generation of technology services winners. We pick inspired management teams. We go find the best businesses in particular niches in technology and otherwise. And we invest behind those leaders to help them um, grow and scale their businesses. Right. Uh, talk to us about your portfolio companies and uh, your Indian operations. So we've got uh, right now, uh, Siddharth, we've got nine companies in the portfolio. Uh, of those, of those, port of those port nine companies, uh, uh, seven, uh, six or seven of them uh, have operations in India. Uh, so, so the vast majority uh, have uh, some presence in India. Uh, and I suspect that uh, that will continue to be the case uh, in in the recognized portfolio. India is such an important part of the global technology um, ecosystem that I suspect that a large number of our um, portfolio companies will uh, will will have presence in India. If you look at the uh, the the total headcount across all of our portfolio companies, about a third of the delivery headcount. Uh, across all of our portfolio companies uh, is in India. And um, 
as I said before, the portfolio, uh, what we try to do is focus on um, uh, high growth, uh, folks, very specialized areas in the technology ecosystem. And so our, our portfolio is, is concentrated around things like high growth cloud, digital engineering, uh, data and analytics and AI, uh, next generation BPO, and the future of work. So these are the big themes against which we've invested so far. Uh, when you make an investment choice, is it because of uh, the skill set availability or is it uh, cost or a mix of these factors? Uh, and if you could uh, expand on the uh, potential that you see as far as your portfolio companies are concerned. No, I think that it's, um, it's, it's, I've always said this, I, you know, in my recognized um, avatar and others that to say that India is the back office of the world is is not doing justice to India. I think that the, um, the what India has is an incredible talent base, uh, and we we can't forget that India is one of the largest pools of technology talent anywhere in the world, uh, and is producing technology talent at a rate that few other countries in the world are. And so, the the real attraction, the real value proposition that India has. And the reason that I'm optimistic about India for the long run uh, is simply the fact that um, as technology becomes uh, more prevalent around societies around the world, uh, India is producing more technology talent than virtually anybody else in the world and therefore um, should attract its at least its fair share, but perhaps its unfair share of that, um, uh, of that increase in demand. I also want you to uh, tell our viewers about the Indian fintech space. Now, clearly, this is an industry that has shown a lot of uh, cutting-edge uh, capacity. Some of the work that is being done by our, our companies are uh, improving the lives of people in India. W what are your views about the Indian fintech space? Yeah, look, I think, I think this is an interesting moment uh, for financial services around the world. Um, as as we as we enter um, a, a world where interest rates are rising around the world, um, it makes the financial services industry uh, an interesting uh, an interesting place to to invest and to make money. Um, uh, I've, we've done some work in the fintech in the fintech space, and what I would say is that there are tremendous opportunities uh, to drive revenue and to increase efficiencies across the fintech industry. Um, and so, you know, smart entrepreneurs have a, um, a significant advantage. Having said that, I also think that you can't underestimate um, the, um, the regulatory complexities of uh, operating in, in the fintech world uh, around the world. What is happening in the broader private equity space? Uh, you know, the reason I ask you this is that if you sort of look at it in overall terms, uh, the era of uh, easy money, uh, lots of liquidity is perhaps not going to be coming back anytime soon. You know, I think um, uh, I'm, I'm not a private equity expert by any stretch of the imagination, uh, Siddharth. What I can tell you is what, what we're, where we are focused at recognize, um, which is that our belief has always been that uh, a big part of the value add that we provide at recognize is because we are sector focused. All we do is um, is um, uh, invest in one industry that is technology services, and at recognize, you know, we are a, a group of investors and operators working side by side to create value. Our approach has always been to to create fundamental value in our portfolio companies by um, by growing the growing the businesses, uh, improving the margins, adding uh, creating differentiation in the business to improve the fundamental uh, value of the business. Across our portfolio, our use of leverage is, is very, very low, has, has historically been low. We use a little bit of leverage, but, but certainly not a substantial amount. Uh, and so we continue to believe that our formula of finding great management teams, finding great companies, and focusing on building real operational value within those companies, or, or building real value in those companies by by helping the, the leadership teams operate the companies better, helping them grow revenue faster than they might otherwise have been able to grow, helping them improve their margins, helping them create uh, different sources of differentiation. 
creates fundamental value and makes these businesses more valuable. And over time, that uh, um, uh, creates uh, returns for our investors. What kind of companies, IT companies, will be winners, let's say, in 2047? What uh, will the companies need to do to be able to be winners at that point of time in the future? You know, Siddharth, look, again, I don't have a crystal ball. It's a great question. <laughs> Um, here's what I would say. Um, I think that uh, the firms, the firms that we know today, um, a subset of them will continue to survive and thrive. There's no question in my mind because the market opportunity is there. Um, but for those companies in the I, in the technology services industry, um, uh, particularly the large firms, success is not guaranteed. Um, I think that the market is changing fast. And these firms need to adapt uh, to the new realities if they are going to survive in the long run. And this is something that we've seen over and over and over again in the technology services industry. If you look back over the history of technology, every time there has been a major shift in the technology landscape, um, new technology services winners have emerged, but equally um, stalwarts of the past eras have disappeared. If you look back on uh, the history of this industry, firms like EDS, uh, Perot Systems, CSC, uh, these firms don't exist in their, car in their former avatars anymore. And so the current generation of, of technology services companies have an opportunity, a tremendous opportunity, but have to reinvent themselves. So that's one side of the answer. The other side of the answer is that I see tremendous opportunity for new winners to emerge at this point. This is a moment where there's so much change going on in the industry that a new generation of winners will emerge. And those winners, we maybe they exist today, maybe they don't, they only exist in someone's imagination today. Um, but over the next 40 years, um, there will be a new generation, there, there will be the next cognizant. It will, it will emerge, it will look very different, um, but there will be another uh, set of winners that emerge. And, you know, we're rooting for those players where, you know, hopefully recognize will we'll play a role in, in, in starting and incubating some of those, those businesses. But equally, uh, uh, it's a tremendous opportunity for every entrepreneur out there. Absolutely. And we know that you'll do a very good job at picking uh, the winners of tomorrow. Francisco de Souza, thank you very much for your time with us today. With that, it's a wrap on this show. Thank you very much for watching. <laughs>